Hello, my name is uh, Christopher Coker. I'm uh, director of uh, LSE Ideas and welcome to this meeting, which is uh, resetting the transatlantic uh, relationship, uh, the uh, relationship between the Biden administration, the United States in general and Central Europe. Why are we having this discussion today? Well, we're at a we always say we're at a seminal moment in relations, particularly when we talk about the transatlantic alliance. But I think we are in a, a seminal moment. Um, the United, the uh, European Union has announced its wish to reinvigorate the transatlantic partnership. But within uh, Europe itself, there are divisions uh, between uh, its members, um, between those who would like to go for strategic autonomy in hope of improving the relations with the US, others who would like to actually, quite frankly, reset the relationship with Russia, one or two of them in the region that we're discussing today, and others, I think, perhaps all concerned that um, President Trump won 75 million votes. That's more than anyone who's ever lost an election in American history and but for COVID-19 would almost, I think, certainly have been re-elected uh, for a second term. So the political scene in the United States, I think, has changed. Uh, Trump may have been defeated, but Trumpism hasn't. Secondly, um, President Biden, although he is well disposed towards Europe and well disposed towards the transatlantic relationship, leads a fractured, uh, fractious and divided uh, country. And we should remember that not a single Republican in the House of Representatives or the Senate, not one, voted for the COVID recovery bill, which he put forward. And yet, of course, under President Trump, there was a remarkable degree of bipartisan consensus between Republicans and Democrats on Russia. And despite uh, Trump's personal predilection for Vladimir Putin and his personal antipathy towards NATO, there was no antipathy towards NATO and no friendship for President Putin in either the Republican or the Democratic parties. So that will that bipartisanship continue? Uh, into the Biden years or not. So will Biden uh, actually make a difference? And if so, how? Uh, and uh, what is the position of Central Europe and the Central European members of NATO in the process of reaffirming uh, the transatlantic relationship? Now, to help us understand those questions, we have three excellent panelists. We have Lauren Speranza, who is Director for Transatlantic Security from the Center for European Policy Analysis in, in Washington. We have uh, uh, Wojciech Mishnik, who is Assistant Professor of International Relations and Security Policy at Jagiellonian University in Krakow. And we have Christopher Reeves, who is a lecturer at uh, the uh, Ignatianum uh, University, uh, also in Krakow. And since we tend to get cut off very abruptly at the end of these meetings, can I just recommend to you a paper which LSE Ideas and the Ratsu Forum has published, which is actually now on our website, you can find it. It's, all, it's called Sea Change, the Impact of uh, the US Presidential Elections. Wojciech is actually one of its authors and it ranges very widely, more widely than we will be ranging today in our discussions from the Western Balkans to the Black Sea and uh, Central Europe. Okay, well, I've asked each speaker uh, to confine their remarks to 12 minutes, most uh, each, and then we'll open it up to the Q&A. And please, will you post up your questions as we go along in the Q&A box so that I can see the questions as they come up on the screen. So let's uh, start, uh, Lauren, if we may, with you. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's really a, an honor and a pleasure to be here and provide a bit of a Washington perspective. Um, and I thought I would just start um, to follow on to that wonderful introduction, um, a few words on Biden's overall approach to Central and Eastern Europe and kind of how this fits into the overall transatlantic security picture. And I think the three kind of main priorities of the Biden administration's foreign policy really kind of stand out as rebuilding the country at home, re-establishing U.S. leadership abroad and fighting against authoritarianism, particularly with allies and partners. And I think overall, there has been some speculation over how the Biden administration would engage Central and Eastern Europe, in part because, as you mentioned, the Trump administration, despite all of the political turbulence and with, with Europe and damaging rhetoric to allies, had actually deepened U.S. cooperation with CEE. 
And part of this was based on the recognition that the region had become a key front line for strategic competition with Russia and China. Um, and there was really a need for more intentional, constructive, and visible U.S. engagement there. And, and we saw that take place through infrastructure development, through the C's, Three Cs initiative, which I know some of my colleagues will touch on later, um, and also through bilateral security cooperation. And, and we saw many of the region's national leaders, for example, in Hungary and Poland and Slovenia, sort of hitch themselves to the Trump train. And uh, you could argue sort of use that as a shield or a buffer in their own sharpening criticism of the EU, in their national shifts away from some of the shared democratic values and, and Euro-Atlantic principles that were less important in the Trump administration's transactional approach. So this really begs the question of, where does this leave the region now that the Biden administration is coming in with this laser focus on democracy promotion and in some ways a different approach to foreign policy? And I think there are some good signs for continued engagement with the region mixed with a few challenges and some cautionary words uh, to keep in mind going forward. I wanted to start with two positive notes. I think one is on security and defense. The Biden team has been very clear about its recommitment to the transatlantic relationship and to NATO in particular. Security and defense in Central and Eastern Europe is the U.S.'s strong suit, I think, where it's seen as the primary security advisor. So I think that will remain a key pillar of U.S. foreign policy in the region. We saw a very strong speech at uh, the Munich Security Conference special event where President Biden you know, reiterated America is back with an ironclad commitment to Article 5, collective defense. Biden himself has been a huge supporter of, of Central and Eastern Europe's accession to NATO. He knows the stakes, so I think his team will continue to build upon all of that security and defense cooperation um, to deter Russia in particular. And I think there's much more to do to build a more coherent force posture in Europe's east uh, as Biden undergoes this global force posture review. Um, I personally think there's a big gap between the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea and trying to prioritize key allies like Poland in the middle, that sort of bridge between the two will be key. Um, and even as the defense budget is predicted to stay flat or even slightly decrease, I think the Biden team has learned the lesson from the Obama years that we actually can't pull our capabilities out of Europe and it really is key to invest with our allies there. So I think that will be continued going forward. The second is on geoeconomic competition. I think the Biden team has also continued the Trump administration's focus on geopolitical competition with Russia and China, which is another reason to keep CEE as a core focus. The region's obviously a natural partner for the U.S. against Russia and increasingly for China, given that Washington can't solely focus on the Indo-Pacific to push back on Chinese influence. I think the challenge for the U.S. here is continuing to build up its geoeconomic weight without maybe being perceived as interfering in some of the EU's affairs. Um, we've seen some positive signals, I think, from Secretary of State Blinken, um, embracing the Three Cs initiative, you know, investing and cooperating on energy security, transportation, and, and IT infrastructure, diversifying supply chains. And I think there's a lot more that U.S. firms can do, in particular in the private sector, trying to leverage the U.S.'s Development Finance Corporation um, on things like nuclear and renewables. I also think there's a huge potential for more cooperation on digital issues. Um, that pillar of the Three Cs initiative is, is the least defined so far, as well as on tech. And I think as we're starting to see some of these regional hotspots emerge um, as new innovation hubs, those are places where the U.S. actually shouldn't shy away from it, but I think offer alternatives to Chinese capital and investment. And I think more importantly, a lot of CEE countries are now realizing that 17 plus one and, you know, some of the promises that are coming from China are not all they're cracked up to be and are actually turning out to be quite hollow in many cases, except for maybe vaccines. Um, so I think this leaves Biden and Blinken in a good place to pick up on what Secretary Pompeo had actually started in bringing the region as a closer partner on a transatlantic approach to China. Now, there are two challenges, I think, that are maybe uh, I'm less optimistic about. Um, one question is the Russia-China balance. And I think the Biden administration's interim national security guidance um, very much solidified China as the number one strategic challenge that will characterize U.S. foreign policy. Now, Russia was, of course, mentioned. Biden himself has been tough on the Kremlin. Um, but Russia was characterized more as a declining power, a sort of a spoiler that we need to continue countering through the lens of foreign malign influence, but it wasn't elevated as an acute security threat in the way I think that it hasn't in the past. Um, and this has been a bit of a concern for some allies in Central and Eastern Europe 
per perhaps reminiscent of the Obama reset years, certainly not helped by the unwillingness uh, of Biden to, to not issue sanctions on Nord Stream 2. So I think the Democratic Party has really been split on the Russia question. There's one camp sort of rooting for reset by another name. I think there's another camp that's rooting for a, a tougher line. I think we're starting to come around more towards the tougher line, especially having Blinken, Newland, Molly Montgomery, and other types of transatlanticists in key roles. But I do have some concern about the increasing focus on the Indo-Pacific, perhaps at Europe's expense, combined with the need for the U.S. to focus on issues at home, um, on public health and economic. Um, as you mentioned in the introduction, you know, I think one issue is that Congress is no longer playing this role as the key advocate for transatlantic relations because it's almost taken as a given with Biden in power. You know, they think of him as one of the last romantic transatlanticists. And so I think um, that actually has, has demotivated Congress to play this strong role in some of the legislation that will go along with that. So I think this under, underscores the fact that the region has to come prepared with constructive things they're ready to work on with the U.S., including a more principled approach to Russia and China, um, more commitment to burden sharing. And um, I think we just need to not waste this moment of renewed engagement and really need to make sure that CEE countries have skin in the game and make it clear what they want to proactively do with the U.S. And the last challenge I would highlight is, I think, on values and political issues. You know, it's become very clear that the Biden administration sees its foreign policy first and foremost through the lens of shared values and principles, democracy, human rights, rule of law. And I think this is going to pose some problems for some regional countries like hun Hungary and, and Poland to an extent, which have publicly been confronting um, challenges to these principles. And those authoritarian developments in the region really have a negative impact on the United States um, integrity and credibility with its allies. And I think we'll start to see some rhetorical pressure from the, from the administration on this. And there is a real risk that if regional capitals are not willing to engage with the U.S.'s values-based expectations, they may push themselves further back in the line in terms of engaging with America. And, and this is not to say that the Biden administration will come out swinging, you know, trying to put restrictions on security cooperation or something like that. I think Biden does want to be a stabilizing power and will want to build on the momentum of, of some of the free cities mayors and things like that. But I think it's, and it's highly unlikely that Biden would, would touch any of the defense agreements signed under the Trump administration with Poland and Hungary. But I do think Biden has made a clear point of highlighting the State Department over the Pentagon as the primary tool for engaging allies and partners. And uh, they really put values front and center. And, and I think regional capitals will have to take note and there's really no getting off the hook there. Um, a few final thoughts just to wrap up. I think moving forward on all of these issues is going to take care, careful coordination with the European Union and also key players in Western Europe as well. Um, renewing relations with Germany is a key question um, when we're thinking about CEE. I think there's been some encouraging signs in terms of the U.S reviewing the decision to withdraw forces from Germany, trying to reset the terms of, of German-U.S. relations. But as Germany goes through its own leadership changes, you know, there are big questions over how these new officials will respond to U.S. calls for Germany to continue taking a bigger leadership role in regional security and development um, and for Germany to stand up to China as well. And on the broader EU question, I think we've seen some positive moves from von der Leyen and others trying to create a new transatlantic agenda on everything from security to trade to climate change to public health. But there are major divergences still that risk expanding between the U.S. and EU on major issues like technology and, and China, as I mentioned, even though the gap is starting to close there. Um, and, and last thought, what's more, I think for all of the talk of America's back, um, I think the U.S. still has some work to do in terms of earning its leadership role at the table. Um, we can't just pretend that the Trump years did not happen. They have. They have fundamentally impacted transatlantic relations. And even just watching a few things like the EU-China investment deal, where, where the EU sort of pursued its own agenda despite U.S. feedback, um, and maybe even the lack of consultation around some of the things that came out in the U.S. interim national security guidance, although we don't want to read into that too much, but I think it remains to be seen exactly what a more mature and equitable partnership between the U.S. and Europe will look like in practice and whether the EU will be prepared to step back in and kind of support America's agenda or whether it will try to keep its foot uh, a little bit more on the gas uh, towards, you know, pursuing greater autonomy. Uh, although, of course, you can debate how much gas there was to begin with. Um, but on the whole, I think 
Biden's foreign policy will be a good thing for both Central and Eastern Europe and for the U.S. Uh, we're well on our way to building a robust agenda for cooperation, but it just certainly doesn't happen overnight. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, thank you for putting the, the view from, from Washington, uh, which has been in the news recently because the, the Russian ambassador was recalled uh, to the US just a few days ago. So uh, the relationship with Russia looks as though it's deteriorating uh, already. I'd like to come back to you on that in the, the Q&A and also the points you touched upon uh, about values uh, as opposed to transactionalism, which I think is, is a key factor. But let's move on. Uh, Wojciech, can we hear from you, please? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me, and I'm delighted to, to be in such a distinguished panel. So uh, my couple of points will deal with the how basically uh, you know transatlantic relations are seen from let's say Central European or Polish perspective. I would say uh, an underline a Polish perspective, not the Polish perspective. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about two major themes uh, that are currently or has been currently discussed in, in Poland. One is, of course, you know, the never-ending uh, discussion about keeping the U.S. and NATO commitment to deter Russia on the eastern flank. And the other one would be to address the geopolitics of energy security in Central Eastern Europe through the question of the Nord Stream 2 debate right now and the usefulness of the Free Seas Initiative. Um, and I'm going to finish uh, or wrap things up with uh, some of the negative and positive signals so far that you know we can kind of see uh, that, that that happened over the last couple of months. So um, let me begin by uh, saying that basically, you know, as the standoff between Russia and NATO extends, there are growing concerns in Central Europe uh, about ability of the alliance actually to wait out Russia without making any concessions that would compromise um, the United Transatlantic Front. I think Lauren has already touched upon those. Um, and also I know, you know that for some of the viewers outside of Poland, it, it might almost sound like a broken record that we are kind of, you know, coming back to this idea that, you know, that uh, uh, NATO, but also the US, we need to stand firm uh, and almost reaffirm every now and then that uh, uh, will not uh, make concessions to the aggressive Russian policies, especially uh, given what's going on in Ukraine, especially uh, given what's going on uh, in, in, in Russia itself. Um, so I don't have too much time to discuss Russia's other you know, ambitions that go you know, also you know, to Libya and to some of the Middle Eastern countries, but uh, uh, if we even stick to the eastern flank, uh, uh, from the most of the Polish commentators, it's basically almost a sacred sound to kind of keep, uh, you know, the alliance on one page. And as both Verso Coker and Lauren has already indicated, it's not that easy because there is a kind of wearing patience uh, uh, among some of the allies, especially in Europe, to kind of move on and start kind of a different dialogue with Russia. And again, I would like to stress that I'm not against dialogue with, 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 with Russia. I think that that's, you know, that, that, that's the actor NATO and also, you know, that the transatlantic community need to deal with. But, you know, we need to deal it on kind of our conditions without actually um, allowing Russia to, you know, kind of win the not only information warfare, so to speak, but also their uh, campaign against Ukraine that started in 2014. Uh, so, 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 so this is this is one point. The other that is connected to the U.S. and NATO commitment is, of course, that the dreams of, of of European strategic autonomy are not dead yet in Europe, and uh, 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 we can argue that you know some of the uh, uh, developments connected to the pandemic are bringing back this debate, and you know may, maybe. Some of the uh, European states would like to be more, you know, kind of Euro-oriented rather than transatlantic-oriented. This is not a new debate, and I'm sure we all know it. Uh, it comes and goes uh, in the transatlantic uh, spectrum. But I think that, uh, you know, the question from the point of view of Poland remains, um, you know, how do we, uh, 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 how are we able 
as a community to negotiate, you know, the uh, uh, European part of, of being strong in terms of defense and security without actually giving up, um, you know, the, the strong NATO stance uh, uh, overall. Um, so, and the, the third uh, issue connected, you know, this is a question also debated uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, is how to deal with Russia, actually. You know, what is the end game? Uh, and I think it has not been really uh, voiced yet, uh, both by Biden administration, but also to some extent by, by NATO. Uh, uh, we are kind of in a stage of waiting uh, and seeing what's going on. And, and of course, uh, it hasn't been even 100 days of Biden administration. So, you know, it's not my way of saying that, you know, that they, that they, they should kind of speed up the process. But it's just, you know, the observation that given all the developments happening in, in, in Central Eastern Europe, um, it's almost like, you know, we are waiting to have a very strong signal, uh, you know, how to deal with Russia. And the signal should go both from uh, uh, D.C., but also from Brussels. And when I say Brussels, I mean, of course, NATO, but, you know, it will be even greater if it can be referred by, uh, by, by European Union. Um, so... Um, the second point of my uh, of, of, of my short talk will deal with the kind of geopolitics of energy security in Central and Eastern Europe, and of course, the, like a, the the large elephant in the room is North Stream Two, and this is the potential to actually spoil the party of Biden administration, kind of coming back to Europe on the white horse. Um, especially that Germany right now has a kind of a big problem to or big decision to make whether they are going to stick with Nord Stream 2. Um, uh, and if not, what are the consequences of, 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 of giving up? Uh, the project is 90% ready and uh, it, it costs uh, you know, an enormous amount of money, not to mention political capital. But on the other hand, there is a, like a... a, 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 a Stanch opposition, uh, not only in Poland but in some of the uh, reg regional states, against the uh, uh, the project. And even given the uh, uh, the sanctions that the Biden administration right now is uh, uh, rethinking, it, it would be very telling to see which way it goes. Uh, I'm no expert on Germany, but I would argue that you know the, the German government, whether this one or the one that will be formed after September election will have a big headache, uh, you know, to kind of solve this problem. Um, and uh, without this, I don't think we can talk about, uh, let's say, repairing uh, transatlantic relations, uh, uh, you know, after Trump years. Um, and the second issue here connected is, of course, the, the free sea initiative, initiative that was started by both Croatia and, and, and Poland in 2016. And uh, uh, the project uh, uh, has been positively uh, seen by uh, both Trump and, and also Biden administration from slightly different reasons. Um, of course, uh, as Lauren already said, since China is the name of the game in, in, in D.C., um, uh, uh, Free Seas Initiative is mostly seen uh, by administration as kind of a counterbalance of to China's influence or growing influences in the Central and Eastern European region. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we need to remember that there were some slightly different ways of viewing this project uh, from the Polish authorities at the very beginning. Uh, this project was not only a, a pro original project in bringing 12 or even more states in kind of a one uh, under one roof, but also it was a, a, a a way of trying out uh, uh, European Union and kind of showing that, um, you know, we in Central Eastern Europe can also do some our, of our own cooperation. Um, so if Trump, uh, excuse me, if Biden administration is really committed to this multilateral approach and the diplomatic approach to, to, to deal with those things, probably the more concern will be put on uh, uh, this initiative, Free Seas Initiative, as something that builds bridges rather than separates some countries against the others. So this might be a potential uh, uh, issue for Warsaw, um, uh, and we'll see how it goes. Um, 
And finally, I don't want to, uh, 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 you know, I think my, my time is almost done. Finally, I have a couple of observations that, you know, we can already make because of, you know, what happens in the relations, uh, you know, between the Biden administration and some of the European allies. And um, I will start with some of the negative signals um, that, you know, that affect transatlantic relations. Uh, well, the first one is obvious, you know, the pandemic is far from over and the consequences are yet to be assessed. And, you know, that we are right now, at least in, in, in Poland, in the midst of the third wave of the pandemic um, and the potential economic uh, uh, consequences will be dire. Uh, we still don't see the end in sight in terms of the kind of transatlantic uh, 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 end of the pandemic. So the EU, US has been struggling even more than, than some of the Central Eastern European states. And this means that um, some of the uh, uh, projects, some of the, let's say, more active approach is right now put on hold. Uh, uh, it's almost like we are on pause and waiting out the, the, the pandemics, which means that some of the changes that were expected to happen, at least from the from, from, the, from, from the central European perspective are not there yet because um, there are other important things to, to address uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and the second point is really connected to, to, to the pandemic and it's what I call the growing disunity among allies caused by the so-called vaccination politics. And uh, we can see it, you know, in Europe that some of the states, they kind of are bringing back the more nationalistic agenda that are that go way beyond on the pandemic itself. Um, uh, as a consequence, it might be quite dangerous for uh, going back to transatlantic business as usual. Um, uh, uh, and of course, you know, the third one uh, and the one that I already uh, addressed is the looming rift over Nord Stream 2. Um, and by the way, I, I don't want to sound like I'm very too much, you know, optimistic, you know, and sometimes we think that uh, uh, Biden administration might bring, you know, the new hope that, you know, we are going to bring transatlantic relations from the great crisis to the great success and i think it's much more complicated than that it's not about really great success it's actually to going back to the you know dialogue and debate as usual without having hopes that we'll solve it as lauren said i mean you know for for the us uh, uh there is much more to 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 to, to the to, to the global affairs than russia and, and europe um, and of course i don't think that we in europe address the question of, you know, how do we treat China collectively? And I think this is also the question that at some point we would need to uh, answer. Just to finish off on the some of the positive signs, well, first of all, Biden's administration already reaffirmed uh, the strong dedication of, of, of the United States to, uh, to transatlantic ties, you know, both with the uh, 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 telephone conversation with NATO Secretary General and with other uh, 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 strong diplomatic signals that reaffirm commitment to, to NATO. And it might be something little, but I think that the previous uh, administration started their tenure on a completely different note. So we should kind of cherish those little things uh, once they are here. Um, and uh, uh, the the last one from 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 this positive kind of a, of the hat, if you will, developments is a, a returning debate or returning need to NATO and EU cooperation. I think that at this point, most of the uh, 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 member states understand that we will need to do uh, more with less. And if we don't see eye to eye, meaning NATO and European Union, there will be much more trouble for us and there will be just no resources for us to, to, to have to solve some of the transatlantic rifts. And with this in mind, I will stop uh, and looking forward for, for our Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wojciech. I will uh, ask you um, when we have a chance um, a little bit more about Russia. Uh, and whether it's possible to improve the relationship, which has been stuck for seven years, 
Um, uh, we talk about strategic autonomy. I think when the West Europeans talk about it, they mean strategic autonomy from the United States. I think in Eastern Europe, they mean strategic autonomy from Russia, which means be very careful, see Nord Stream 2 not as a business deal, as the Germans insist, but as having direct strategic significance as the Biden administration insists. But anyway, I will come back uh, on that uh, uh, after we've heard from, from Christopher. Over to you. Well, <clears throat> I'll repeat my uh, colleagues by expressing my thanks. Uh, to be actually invited um, at, uh, at uh, such a prestigious uh, event such as this. Um, and I think I'm sort of facing the challenge that uh, any last speaker always faces in these situations and trying not to repeat what has already been said. Uh, suffice to say, though, I mean, I largely agree with most of what uh, Lauren and Wojtek were, were saying. Um, Rather than, um, you know, rather than sort of reiterate though the points that they have made, I thought what I would try to do today, uh, first of all, I should say my own area of interest or even expertise, I suppose, is Polish foreign policy Pol and Polish security policies. Um, and I've been interested in that ever really, really, I suppose, since I first moved to Poland. So I've been sort of observing um, um, you know, the Polish foreign policy scene now for a few years, not just in terms of the sort of um, uh, the American Polish relationship, but also, I suppose, in a, sl in a slightly wider context. So, what I thought I would try and do is provide a little bit of context. Um, so, the first part, I'm going to do this very, very quickly because I'm all too aware that we're short of time. But for the first part, I'm just going to provide, give a very, very quick overview of, of, of how Polish foreign policy sort of developed. Um, and then I'm going to want to then move on to some more recent history and maybe just discuss one or two of the main, I suppose, developments during the Trump administration. And then finally, I will conclude and perhaps try and get out my crystal ball and uh, try and give some kind of sense of what might actually happen or what, what, what might be the, some of the main developments in terms of, in terms of Polish foreign policy. So as I said, my focus is very much on Poland. I suppose I'm giving the sort of British Polish view here on what's going to happen. Let me first of all turn to the first part. As I say, I'm going to do this very quickly, but suffice to say, when, when you look at the trajectory of Polish foreign policy, so you look at the periods through the 90s into the 21st century. Um, well, I would say for the 90s, the chief priorities were obviously, from, from Poland's perspective, was to achieve membership of the European Union and NATO, and of course, by 2004, they do that. Related to that, the other key feature of Poland's foreign policy in this period was its Atlanticism. And uh, when I first came to Poland around 2003, 2004, it was quite striking um, how much comment, I suppose, there was on the pro-American um, attitude of the Polish government at that time. Obviously, the context for this was 9-11, the war on terror things like that, Poland contributing some of its own military forces to the invasion of Iraq. And there was a plethora of articles discussing, um, uh, you know, the special relationship, for want of a better term, uh, between Poland and the United States. So there were, you know, there were, there were titles such as, Pol uh, such as America's protege in the East and Poland being America's new model ally. Moving on from that, what you see in the later 2000s, I think, is what you could describe as a sort of normalization of the Polish-American relationship. I think this certainly takes place after around, I suppose, around after 2007, I suppose, um, when pl platform of Vitelsko, which was a sort of center-right, moderate political party, they were in govern, they were the main governing party in Poland from 2007, 2015, ideologically not dissimilar to the German uh, Christian Democrats. Um, and obviously, you know, obviously uh, uh, their approach to the United States is still friendly, but I think there was less of a desire to sort of cultivate this sort of special, as I say, this sort of special relationship um, and one area that could, was quite notable, and this is an area that I've written a little bit about myself, um, is that there was a distinct lack of enthusiasm 
uh, for Poland to participate in overseas uh, military missions as part of, you know, a, a, as a part of a multinational operation. Um, and that was most strikingly seen, I suppose, in 2011, when Poland chose to exclude itself uh, from the NATO intervention against Libya. Okay, moving back, as I said, that was just a little context. I want to then now move on and talk a little bit about how, um, how I suppose, the relationships sort of developed during the Trump period. Um, um, platform of Obervatelska, as I say, uh, they um, leave power, they lose the 2015 election to law and justice, Pravo Livost. Um, so law and justice are in power from 2015. So shortly, you know, shortly, well, one year before um, the uh, 2016 presidential election in the United States, obviously Trump, to the surprise of many, uh, won the 2016 election. So from the beginning of 2017, then you have Trump in power in the United States, law and justice um, um, governing alone, they, they secured a majority in the Polish parliament. And as many uh, have commented, one of the most striking features um, in this period is that um, um, the, you know, Donald Trump and I suppose uh, the leadership of peace, uh, leadership of law and justice, uh, their values overlapped um, quite strongly. Um, so the government in Poland, I think slightly misleadingly, but is often described as a sort of populist government. Uh, they certainly shared several uh, very similar traits to uh, traits to uh, 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 Donald Trump. Uh, so for one thing, for example, uh, there was uh, skepticism, if not cynicism, towards the mainstream media. Um, in Poland, the governing party basically took sort of editorial control over um, uh, the state's television channel um, and and suddenly the news coverage of that channel basically it, it, it sort of makes Fox News look almost objective in its in its, uh, in its coverage um, um, so there was there was that um, there was also um, the government and I think this was quite clearly seen in the in you know, the relatively recent presidential election but the but the Polish government also launched um, several what you might describe as sort of culture wars and there was growing sort of concern about the way uh, the Polish government was sort of treating both inside and beyond Poland, beyond Poland about the way that the government was treating uh, the LGBTQ community and things like that. Um, but you do see, I think, and I'm sort of conscious I'm short of time now, um, you do see, I think, a sort of flourishing to some extent of the relationship um, um, in this period. And I think, you know, the government was quite successful in, some, in, in, in getting quite a lot of what it wanted from the Trump administration. Um, to try and put it as succinctly as possible, basically, I think um, they were successful in, achieve, in achieving uh, um, a significant sort of upgrading of the Americans' uh, military presence on, on Polish territory, which was something that uh, Poland has wanted for a long time. Um, in 2018, President Duda visited Washington. Um, and in fact, there was actually a famous, uh, or famous in Poland at least, photograph of Trump and Duda in the Oval Office with Trump sitting at the desk and Duda, who had not actually been given a chair, forced to sign um, um, a, a, an agreement on, on defense cooperation bent over, which seemed, which many people thought sort of symbolized, symbolized the sort of relationship that was sort of developing between the two. Um, so there were obvious, um, Wojtek has mentioned the, the, the Three Seas initiative as well, so I won't go into that, but again, you know, the Trump administration's commitment to that um, very much sort of fell, yeah, uh, was, again, was something that the Polish government very much um, wanted. There were obvious differences as well, and that, and of course, um, um, Trump's um, flirtation, if for want of a better word, with Vladimir Putin was obviously an area that it was certainly an area that caused some concern for Poland. Um, 
his you know, occasional statements that he would like to see the United States or suggest that the United States might actually withdraw from NATO, obviously from the perspective of Warsaw, that was problematic to say the least. But so, you know, there were problems. OK, as I say, I'm very realize I'm short of time. So let me quickly turn to the Biden administration, but maybe maybe I can develop some of these themes more deeply in the subsequent discussion. Um, Again, I would say looking at from from the perspective of Poland, I think the Biden administration, again, I think there's there's a sort of mixture there between areas of common concern and obvious problems. Again, I think Wojtek and Lauren have touched upon a couple of those already. Um, I think in terms of the geopolitical view, I think the Biden administration, some of its views on Russia are probably going to be closer to the Polish government. Again, I, I think as Wojtek said, I think it was Wojtek anyway, so uh, uh, mentioned the fact that, that perhaps initially there was some concern uh, given um, the Obama administration's attempt to reset relations with Russia, that something similar might happen again. Um, I think, you know, recent events have sort of demonstrated that there is not going to be some kind of new detente between America and Russia anytime soon. So again, from the Polish perspective, that, you know, that, that would be um, reassuring. Um, areas of difference, again, I think, and again, Wojtek, I think, touched upon this, but um, um, I think there are indications anyway that the Biden administration uh, view is going to view Germany as its chief partner in Europe, although, again, as been, has been mentioned, nobody's quite sure what will happen uh, after Angela Merkel uh, leaves office. Um, but certainly you get a sense that uh, the sense that uh, um, 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 Germany will probably be considered to be um, the Biden administration's chief partner. Um, and then and I realize we've only got about 20 seconds left, but, but so again, we'll, we'll probably be able to come back to this in the discussion. Um, but the values um, uh, difference, which has already been touched upon, that almost certainly could, will prove to be um, uh, a, a significant difficulty. Um, and uh, and, and you know, uh, President Biden, I think, has already made it clear that, um, sorry, that's it. Uh, President Biden has already made it clear that, you know, he, he is concerned about issues such as the rule of law and the weakening of, of, of the free media and other, you know, other senior officials and said something similar. So that is, that is likely to uh, be a problem in the future. Okay, I will end there and hopefully we can return to some of this in the uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Christopher. Um, I'm going to, um, I will turn to you uh, in, in a moment. Um, because there is a question which has been addressed, which I think uh, you, you're very well uh, positioned to answer. But let me start with Lauren uh, and talking about values. Um, and you actually started by saying that Biden has expressed the uh, priority is rebuilding the United States. Of course, that reminds me very much of two speeches Obama gave at West Point. The nation I want to rebuild is my own, not Afghanistan, Iraq or anywhere else. There is a touch of the Obama administration about uh, the Biden administration uh, in terms of personnel. But also, I would say, if one wanted to be critical in, in, in terms of blue sky objectives, you know, people like Jake Sullivan have been tasked with dealing with 400 years of racism in the international system, climate change, goodness knows what else, rather than the old fashioned strategic challenges that American presidents used to have to address. The other thing I would say about values is it might lead to a confrontation at some point between the United States and those uh, EU members whose values may not be those of the Biden administration. And Poland is obviously a case in point. Hungary is, is another. There may be others. You mentioned the 17 plus one. So I'd be also interested in whether you think that's had its day and that certain members of the 17 plus one are now definitely behind the United States or whether they're still going to sit on the fence. Uh, and wish to uh, maintain their, their options. But the first and most important question I have for you is really values. Uh, should, be, should we, in this new world uh, of great power confrontation, which has come back, should we not be dealing more with transactional relationships, agreements and deals struck, rather than falling back on the old Cold War values 
basis of the alliance. Yeah, really interesting question. And I think a key issue, I would actually argue the opposite. I think values have to be the foundation of all of this. I mean, the, this root of, of the, the great power competition or strategic competition or whatever you want to call it, I mean, it's all the biggest challenge is that it threatens you know, the international liberal world order, our shared way of life, and the, the values that Europe and the United States have worked so hard to, to defend and to uh, promote over the years. And so I think if, if we were to resort to denigrating those, I think that would put us in a worse off place in the competition. And I think our biggest advantage um, as the United States is to work with our allies and partners on this, like-minded countries, not only in Europe, but also in the Indo-Pacific. And working with them is going to be our best shot at defending our, our interests, our own interests, as well as our shared interests as a transatlantic community. So I think values absolutely have to be front and center. We've seen what the transactional relationships look like over the last four years. I wouldn't argue that that's necessarily put us in a better place. There are some things that have been positive in terms of, I think, Trump's uh, approach to China in terms of um, sounding the sirens, I think, on some of those concerns have actually been pr quite productive and have moved the ball forward on that set of issues, raising those concerns about growing Chinese influence and the threats to the United States and the transatlantic community. Um, but I think we've seen the damage that it has that that transactional approach has has done to our alliances. And so I think uh, to your first question, values have to be the center. And if you kind of start to think about what that means in practice. I think the the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, I think will probably, especially for a country like Poland, and I'd be interested in, in Christopher and Wojciech's perspective on this, but um, I think Poland has been such an interesting case because it's been able to manage its transatlanticism while still going through these challenges to values at home. And so I think at the end of the day, that transatlantic link will probably win out and will probably be able to maintain the relationship. And, um, and that will still be the basis for, for transatlantic relations and for U.S. relations with Central and Eastern Europe. And I also think, as I, as I sort of alluded to, 17 plus one, I think it's starting to see, I wouldn't say it's over. I think there's, there's still much to come, especially as Belt and Road continues to develop and those kinds of things. But I do think countries are starting to see the light in terms of these, these deals, these transactions with uh, partners like China, um, because in part of the values question are not coming out the way that they had thought, and they're not seeing all of the benefits. So it's in some ways pushing them back towards, um, you know, I think for, for many years, they were hoping not to pick a side, you know, between China and the United States. But if, if they're forced down to it, they're seeing that the benefit is probably to stay, stick with the United States. So I think that um, we will probably head in that direction, I hope. Um, but I think that will continue to be, you know, part of this push and pull. But overall, I think the gap is closing between the United States and Europe on, on an approach to China. And so I think that values-based approach and working with others in the Indo-Pacific that have, that share those democratic values, I think will be kind of the, the major paradigm that we use going forward in this increasingly contested environment. Oh, thank you very much. Because transactionism wasn't just Trump administration it was the Bush administration with the coalitions of the willing and the, sure. the mission determining the alliance, not the alliance, the mission. So we've heard it before, uh, albeit also from a Republican uh, president, the Democrats tend to be, I think, more anchored to, to the value approach. Um, Lauren, you, you asked the other panelists whether they'd like to come back on your point. So please feel free to do that. But can I then ask my individual questions at the same time? So Wojciech, when we come to Russia, the thing that keeps Henry Kissinger awake at night, so he tells us, is the prospect of an alliance between Russia and China. Uh, there is no alliance between Russia and China. There is what Dmitry Chenin calls an entente, perhaps, or a close understanding, but certainly not an alliance. I think not least because the Chinese would not be interested in one at the moment. However, we do seem to be uh, edging towards that. I mean, if you look at uh, some, of, some of the trends, and if you want to prevent it, seems to me it's not the Americans who will prevent it, it's the Europeans who will uh, prevent it because they have the investment in Russia's future, uh, economic uh, and security wise. Russia is their problem more than it's America's problem, quite frankly. So um, what can we do? 
to try to, I won't use the word reset because it has terrible connotations with Hillary Clinton and Russia, but what can we actually do? Or we're going to get stuck because of the Crimea issue and because of Ukraine. It seems to me this is the real Bismarckian question that the Europeans face. Can they actually start talking again to the Russians and trying to strike some deals, which would not be necessarily against values, but would have to acknowledge certain realities, which are not going to change. Um, and the Chinese are the ones who are likely to exploit that situation more than anyone else. It's not even a situation I think the Russians would necessarily wish to find themselves in either, if they had a choice. Anyway, sorry, I kind of presupposed what your answer is going to be. So please go along and um, correct me or, uh, or whatever. Um, I think you're absolutely right. And Europe is almost like, you know, in front of this Faustian Brigade. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not that much optimistic about whether Europe will be able actually to find a way. Uh, because if it's, you know, if the geopolitics are the way you uh, describe them, I think they are. Um, I think that, you know, the, the U.S. will not be that much concerned about Russia as long as Russia is not really closer aligned with China. And that I don't think is going to happen. Uh, as you said, China has no really interest of kind of, you know, bringing closer Russia and, you know, the disparity of power between those two is, is also striking. Um, Russia has been punching above its weight for, for, for at least a decade. And I think uh, in terms of like a, a, a global recognition, they, they they got what they wanted and the recognition that they are still, you know, the power to be reckoned with in international relations, uh, whether it's true or whether it's a perceived uh, 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 way of looking at Russia or the real power, that's of, of course a different story and we can talk about it later. Uh, in terms, you know, what do we need to do here in Europe? Uh, like I said, I would start from this value debate because we cannot escape the values debate uh, at all. And it starts not only, you know, on the Brussels level, it starts also in Warsaw. Um, I would argue that, that, that Poland kind of uh, hurt itself with actually in the downsliding of democracy. And right now we need to explain it uh, uh, you know, to our European, but also American allies, instead of having a united front, it's much more harder to preach that we have same values, uh, you know, as far as NATO is concerned, if we have some democratic problems uh, at home. Uh, and I'm sure that Russia would be first to kind of uh, uh, aim and, and, uh, uh, and use it against the European or transatlantic advantage. I would still uh, 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 repeat that the polite but firm stubbornness is needed in terms of dealing with Russia. Well, we can talk as much as we can, but once we make the concessions that are dealt with the Ukrainian integrity, the territorial integrity, I think it's a slippery slope. There is, from my perspective, there is no coming back uh, once we uh, quote unquote accept that Crimea is done deal. Because that's, uh, that would send a very strong signal to Moscow that um, the European integrity, territorial integrity is up for negotiation. Uh, and it's also very worrying that because of the, uh, the standoff between Russia and, 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 and the NATO uh, has been going for so long that, that, that the patience, let's say in France, but also in Germany is, is, is kind of uh, wearing down and some of uh, so, so, some of the politicians are proposing you know actually forgetting the ukrainian problem and just concentrating on the transactional uh, kind of uh, uh, sphere so um uh, i would say that it will be extremely difficult to start a dialogue within the next one or two years um um, probably we can talk about the things, uh, maybe not even we, the United States and Russia, they can address things that are connected to the nuclear uh, weapons, to, 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 to all the uh, weaponary agreements, but nothing tangible will be achieved as long as there is an agreement also within European camp that we are speaking to Russia with one voice. 
Um, if we don't do this, we'll be played down and played out by Russian diplomats. Um, and I know it sounds like a cliche, but um, that's that, that that's basically true. You know, they don't really respect partners who uh, make concessions without really getting something strong in return. And I will stop here, so I don't want to monopolize the discussion. And thank you. Thank you very much. Um... So I'm going to move to you, Christopher. Do feel free to re reply to the two questions I've asked. But can I ask you a separate one as well? And this comes from David Webster from the UK Romania group, who is uh, British. And it's actually about the, the UK uh, role in this uh, region, obviously uh, in, in Poland, in Estonia, uh, in particular in the Baltic. Um, and it's interesting, I think, that uh, Poland and the UK have traditionally been the most, I don't want to say anti-Russian countries, but most skeptical of all things Russian. And it has a history which goes back to the 19th century. They were skeptical for different reasons, I think, or have been uh, often in the past, not necessarily today. Um, so the question I think uh, that David Webster wants you to ask is what is this uh, British role, particularly post-Brexit? Has, has Brexit made any difference at all? It's mostly a NATO commitment rather than a, uh, a, an EU commitment, for example, in the past. But the other question I would say is, which I think he's also interested, is the link between Romania and Poland. And there's famous the, po the corridor that goes, that links the Baltic and the Black Sea. The fear that if the Russians don't make progress in one area, that they can transfer their attentions to the other. And so there is a close, I think, working relationship between Poland and Romania now. And the UK has a very close defence relationship with Romania. In fact, it's one of the more important uh, European country relationships that the Romanians have. So if you could um, comment on those, but feel free to come back on the other two questions as well. Right. Yes. Managed to unmute my microphone. Good. Um, Okay, yes, um, yeah, there have been some interesting um, points raised there. Um, probably, I'll, I'll just very briefly sort of say that I'm, I, I, I'm, I agree with what, uh, look, what Lauren and Wojtek have, 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 have largely said. I mean, I, I completely agree that values um, is definitely the thing that sort of underpins um, uh, um, the alliance and uh, um, and you know the sort of more transactional approach of the Trump administration um, was actually in many ways I think quite uh, quite corrosive. Although one thing I would say, I mean, uh, um, I think Lauren mentioned um, um, and China and the way that you know there were there was you know some positive aspects to the way that the Trump administration approached its. Uh, uh, approach China and arguably maybe this is more debatable but you might say that that again I'm very very reluctant to give Trump any credit at all uh, on the on this but but I, I mean yeah, I think his emphasis on defense spending in NATO um, and yes it was extraordinarily crude um, but I think it did I mean I think it was effective in sort of perhaps waking up a few of the Europeans uh, and, and thinking to us well hang on a minute can we absolutely rely on the United States maybe we do actually have to get our act together in the area in the area of uh, providing for our own defense rather than being wholly dependent upon uh, um, upon the uh, upon the United States um, and just on the, very, again, very quickly before I answer the question on Romania, um, 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 on Wojtek's point, I mean, again, I absolutely uh, agree. I mean, thinking about the way the Europeans view Russia, I mean, I do think there are sort of, I mean, I think there's always been divisions regarding the Europeans and Russia between those countries like Poland, which historically, for obvious sort of historical reasons, have, have been... Um, sort of instinctively anti-Russian, and I suppose one of my own my own particular areas of interest is, is this idea of strategic culture. Um, and I think when you look at the kind of Polish-Russian relationship, when you look at peace in power in Poland and Putin um, uh, as the Russian president, in many ways there, there are a lot of similarities in terms of 
Putin's value system and the Polish government's sort of value system. I mean, I mean on a whole range of areas, they probably would largely agree when it comes to sort of social, uh, social values and things like that. But the big sticking point, obviously, is history. You know, there's a huge, you know, there's a there's a huge historical um, obstacle there uh, between the two. But you can see other parts of the region, and obviously Hungary would be, you, you know, would be a case in point, which. Um, instinctively is much more sort of amenable to having a having a reasonably good working relationship with Russia. Um, so you can see it in, you know, you can see it in, uh, in, in, in Eastern Europe. And I mean, again, the other point Wojtek mentioned was the sort of fatigue regarding um, the situation in Ukraine, with some countries now beginning to think, so, sort of say, well, you know, let's let's just write off the Crimea and uh, and uh, you know get back to the table and talk, start talking with Russia. I mean, again, I think that again, I, that is very unlikely that you're going to see that approach adopted in Poland again for for obvious sort of historical reasons. But you, but but yeah, I mean, I think these divisions are becoming more apparent. Okay, I'll turn to. Um, uh, David's question on, uh, on on Romania, um, and yeah, just putting it again, I suppose, in this sort of wider sort of tradition of Polish foreign policy. I mean, there is this idea, and, and the Three Seas Initiative sort of falls into this um, um, into this concept. But there, there is this sort of tradition in Polish foreign policy of what is known as between the seas, Mienza Morza. Uh, whereby, um, and this dates all the way back to the 1920s and 1930s with Marshall Pazuski's uh, 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 approach. But it's all about essentially, you know, again, containing sort of Russian um, influence um, in the region um, and, that, and this idea that you do want, um, you know, reasonably strong um, states in East Central Europe as a way of sort of countering Russian expansionist expansionist tendencies. Um, so that, so yeah, um, and absolutely, you know, Romania historically has been a sort of working partner uh, with, uh, with Poland. Um, um, regarding Britain, yeah, so I forgot, forgot about the British part of the British part of the question. Yeah, I mean, Britain's role in the regions is, is interesting. I mean, I do think Brexit does make a big difference, actually. I mean, you're right, it, obviously, in terms of Britain's um, involvement in Europe's security structures and its sort of contribution to um, 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 to to uh, um, you, you know NATO's eastern flank. Um, you know, that, that is obviously NATO, but the fact, I mean, you know, we have witnessed, I think, in the last 20 years or so, this idea uh, that um, the EU should, should, have, should have a much stronger defence identity, you know, with, with its own sort of defence and security policies. Well, obviously, Britain was, you know, Britain was a linchpin with, within all of that. And now that Britain's outside the EU, um, I think that does sort of raise significant questions regarding the EU's capacity to be a sort of security actor. I mean, in that sense, I think the EU almost certainly will be sort of diminished. Um, however, I mean, yes, Britain, you know, Britain withdrew from the European Union, but it didn't withdraw from Europe. And, and you know, as, as you say, you know, Britain is still, um, um, you know, one of the key sort of European powers inside NATO. So obviously Britain will be, you know, will continue to have, um, sort of be uh, playing a really important role uh, when it comes to um, providing uh, security um, in this region. I might have to say, I know a little, not that much about the actual British uh, relationship with Romania. Um, I mean, again, just putting it, putting these countries in their historical, into some sort of historical context. I mean, I, I, I suppose both, both in the case of, of Poland and Romania, um, the relations with France historically, I think have been, um, have been sort of closer um, in that sense. You know, obviously Britain geographically is, has been pretty far removed from this part of, from this part of the world. Um, so yeah, as I said, I'm not, I'm not entirely, as I, I confess to not being completely up on the exact relation, relationship between uh, Britain and Romania. But obviously, yeah, I mean, Britain, Britain is, you know, Britain clearly as, as, as one of the bigger European powers and one of, and one of the, uh, you know, one of the stronger defence uh, countries in terms of providing for defence. I mean, obviously it is going to play, you know, continue to play 
um, a significant role in the region. That answers the question. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I we 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 have only I've got only one question uh, which in the in the box. Um, so I'm going to ask another question uh, as well, uh, and I'll start off with my own question to all three panelists. What is the military threat that Russia poses um, to to NATO? How would you actually define the specific military threat? We've just had the completion of Russia's ten-year defense modernization program. It's largely gone in nuclear capability. So Russia is 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 probably superior to the United States as a nuclear power, but certainly equal. Now, so it doesn't worry about anti-ballistic missile uh, defense systems any longer. It can defend itself. On the other hand, Stoltenberg yesterday, I think, said that thanks to global warming, a new uh, theater of operations has opened up in the Arctic, which he highlighted as being the most likely area for confrontation in the future between the West and Russia, militarily speaking. So I'd be interested in your, in, in, and here, of course, Poland being a Baltic power, that is important, I think, because it's not just the high north that we're looking in, but we're looking at, at the seas in the north and, and the north once again becoming important strategically. The question of, uh, was it last week that Biden said American forces would stay in Germany, but it was rather underwhelming thank you from Merkel, who said, yes, but the Americans aren't always going to be here, quite probably. And if you look at German opinion polls, you'll see that there is a large group of Germans who think that there is no need for American forces in, in Germany and would in fact like to see American forces uh, leave uh, the continent of Europe. Which brings me to the point, a question that has been asked by uh, Lukasz Kamiansky, that if relations between Washington and Berlin are going to be so critical, as our panelists have suggested, how might this affect the Biden administration's strategic choices in this uh, region, in the region of Central and Eastern? Europe. So those are the two questions that we have. Um, and let's start in order of the, the speakers. Lauren, if we could start with you. Sure. Um, so I would say on the first question about what is the Russian military threat? I mean, this is something we think a lot about in Washington. And I would say, you know, the nightmare scenario that that everyone thinks about is, you know, would would Putin try and do a limited land grab in the Baltic states, for example, before the alliance was actually able to respond, um, or even a group of nations? Um, and I think the time distance gap um, is actually the biggest challenge that we face. Um, there are serious problems with readiness, with military mobility, with our ability to get the forces and the personnel where the fight would actually take place in a timely manner. And there's also the political side of that question, which is if if it were to be, um, you know, a fait accompli where a piece of land is already taken, would the alliance and its political leaders actually be willing to go to war um, based on that after the fact? And I would like to say yes, um, but I think there are some serious questions about um, in the minds of some European leaders over the consequences of that. And I think the United States has been very clear about its commitment to Article 5 there, but I think all of these things leading up to that point, um, you know, it's not going to be the alliance that is first to respond. It's going to be a series of countries that is that are willing to respond first and even getting those capable nations on the same page and ready to to get to the fight, I think, is a huge challenge. You know, of course, as you mentioned, there are, you know, missile defense challenges. There's the, the Russian willingness to use tactical nuclear weapons, which I think is a problem. Um, and I think the biggest area of concern is going to be the Baltic Sea, the Black Sea region, and increasingly the high north, as you mentioned. Um, but I think there's a lot more that we can do in the gray zone or the hybrid realm before we get to those challenges, because that is where Putin is going to continue to push the envelope to see what he can get away with. Um, you could, I've also heard, you know, you can make the argument that um, let's let's go with the U.S. characterization of, of Russia as a declining power. You know, does that make Putin more radical, more willing to, to take a risk and try something like actually invading NATO territory? Um, you could argue that, that that could be more likely over time. But I think in the meantime, uh, we certainly need to prepare for those things. That is NATO's primary responsibility in terms of territorial defense. But we have a long way to go in terms of um, 
being able to maintain our strategic edge in the below threshold, like below the Article 5 threshold competition, which is where the majority of this tension is building right now. Um, and then maybe just a quick word on, um, on Germany. I think that the U.S. is really trying to set the right tone with, with Germany. And I think that's been complicated by a couple of things. Um, one is, is the fact that, you know, there are some tensions over China. There are, of course, some tensions over Nord Stream 2. And I think one of the, the consequences, if you're asking about how this might affect Biden's strategic choices, is that I think you could actually see a scenario in which we might let Nord Stream 2 happen because it's not worth disrupting relations with Germany. And I fear that might be the direction that we're headed, just given where Congress is on this. So I think you might start to see us... Uh, the U.S. sort of, um, you know, taking a back foot on on some of these these initial policy choices that we came out swinging on. Um, I also think it will be interesting to watch the forced posture discussion. There is obviously a very symbolic reason that that we halted the decision to remove forces, but I don't think it's necessarily inherently a bad discussion to have about does it make sense to have our forces and capabilities elsewhere and taking into account German preferences and all of that. And, you know, there were some interesting discussions coming out of whether we should put more forces in Romania, given that our discussion was there. Um, and so I think there might be, that story might not be completely over yet. I think there, this global force posture review is going to have some interesting changes coming out of it. Um, so that might actually be be interesting to see what happens with, with what we end up keeping in Germany. Um, the last thing I would say on, um, on the UK, I just wanted to, and Romania, I think it's really important what, what just came out of, of the integrated review. Um, and there's lots of great signals that the US is uh, that the UK is now doubling down on its its relationship through NATO because of the absence from the EU so I think that means it will continue to do more in Romania and in in the broader Black Sea and Baltic region I also think it's interesting to watch um as the U.S. is now contingency planning increasingly for kinetic conflict in the Indo-Pacific, I think it'll be interesting to watch how our force posture and planning changes, you know, assuming that the U.S. would need to be in the Indo-Pacific, would we ask the U.K. to take a stronger role in European defense as opposed to, you know, being with us in the Indo-Pacific? So I think there's some interesting questions there, especially now with, with the new carriers and some things like that. I think you're likely to see more U.K. engagement in um, in the Baltic Sea and Black Sea regions as a result of that. Thank you very much. Bojcik. Okay, so I think Lauren covered uh, uh, eloquently most of the uh, uh, the answers in terms of, you know, how big of the military threat Russia is. So I'm going just to uh, uh, repeat some of the things that I, you know, kind of think are necessary for, for, for us to, to, to discuss. Uh, at least, you know, as, as far as the transatlantic security is concerned. In terms of the mar maritime security and, you know, the, 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 the sea security, uh, of course, it's not only the high north, as you said, or, uh, uh, but, you know, the Baltic Sea might be a problem in the longer run. Uh, you mentioned Poland and, you know, I, 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 I hate to admit, but, you know, Polish uh, uh, Navy is almost non-existent. Just please don't tell Russians. And, and you know, but it's not, it's not only us that are kind of falling behind. Uh, uh, and, of course, uh, you know, I do not envision the, 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 the conflict because you started with the nuclear weapon question. Uh, uh, as much as, as, the, uh, as nukes are important, uh, whether uh, uh, the, the ratio is 60%, uh, 40%, I, I don't think it's as much important as just the willingness to risk uh, the, 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 the war between uh, two, uh, two, two, two sides. Um, but going back to the maritime thing, of course, you know, the Black Sea has been treated by, by Russia as almost an internal swimming pool and uh, annexation of Crimea even reinforced this idea. Um, uh, even, you know, the, the latest uh, uh, maneuvers, Russian maneuvers in the East Mediterranean, their interest not only stems from being engaged in Syria and having their military base there, but also their uh, political or geopolitical interest in Libya. Um, so in a way, the European security realm, if you like, uh, is getting penetrated by Russia more and more. 
which uh, you know if we label them a declining power it's kind of telling whether this is almost like a you know a, 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 a signaling something different or rather being uh, uh, quite desperate um, in terms of the other threats, I probably know that the, 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 the biggest uh, threat is, uh, is of those, you know, so-called hybrid or la like some of the scholars said, cybrid threats, that the ones that are connected between hybrid activities in the gray zones, but also uh, cyber attacks. And, you know, of course, the, 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 the worst case scenario that Lauren already mentioned is, you know, uh, that uh, Putin would test uh, uh, NATO's readiness uh, some, somewhere most likely in, in Baltic states and, you know, kind of the Crimea scenario, but taken to, uh, 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 to, to, to any of the Baltic states. And of course, the lack of the quick response and reaction would basically mean uh, that, you know, that NATO is done. And uh, the, the biggest problem, of course, is that this is a relatively um, cheap uh, uh, way of doing it and with the diversion with the use of special forces uh, uh, and disinformation campaigns uh, it might be it might create so much confusion that it would not look like you know old-fashioned uh, attack of one country to, to the uh, to, to, to other but uh, lack of response would be just devastating at least from from my perspective um, just quickly to Lukas' question on, on, on Germany and whether the, 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 the German-U.S. relationship in Europe uh, is key to transatlantic relations. I would say yes. I mean, that Germany is U.S. go-to player in Europe. And if the United States could do most of the things in, in Europe through Germany, they would gladly do so. Of course, it's not, you know, it's not going to happen. It's not as easy. But the problem is that, that that's why we come back to this debate about Nord Stream 2 um, and uh, how much uh, uh, Germany is willing to give up to have this uh, relationship with the United States. Um, of course, I, uh, I wouldn't be myself if I not commented that Poland um, uh, also ha had some chances to play a smaller than Germany, but also quite significant role if we were able to kind of deal with our internal domestic uh, uh, politics and the, you know, the, the democratic downslide. Um, and Poland was for, for years on a way up uh, in terms of the being uh, quite important on the Washington agenda to be kind of the regional um, uh, uh, power or at least uh, a helper and I think right now as long as we don't solve those problems uh, there is no other country apart from Germany that let's say Biden administration would trust to put kind of a broader agenda uh, uh, on their shoulders um, so I mean uh, also Lukas asked about strategic choices I think they are quite limited uh, if no Germany then, then what? And probably um, uh, maybe Chris might want to take a shot at it because uh, I don't see any other uh, big European power if it's not Germany. I mean, UK, you mentioned also with the integrated review, uh, kind of is back in the, in the European security game. But are other European powers satisfied with that? That's a different story. And especially I'm, I'm talking about France here. Uh, I will stop uh, right now so, so Chris can also address it. Thank you. All right, Chris, could you, um, yes, address those questions. Could you address one more, which will be our last question, unfortunately, given time constraints, and I'd like everyone to do it. So we'll go in reverse order after you, uh, Wojciech, and then finally, Lauren. It's a question asked by Ryszard uh, Nagoski about the connection between public opinion and, and, and government policy making in, uh, I think, in the two countries we're talking about, mostly today, the United States and, and Poland. I think that's important. And I think it touches upon what Dominic Rabb in his speech on the Integrated Review on Wednesday noticed that for the first time in a very long time, the collective GDP of autocracies is now greater than the collective GDP of democracies. Uh, and we're all facing, not only the United States, but my own country as well, and Poland definitely, uh, strains and stresses in the democratic process and a kind of disconnect between the political class, as socialists like to call it, and public opinion. So uh, we'll end on that question, but Christopher, do you want to take up some of the points that have already been raised? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, well, I'll quickly deal with each in turn. Uh, I'll come on to Germany as it's sort of fresh in my head after the previous discussion. Um, and again, yeah, I mean, I sort of agree with uh, what Lauren and Wojtek have sort of said about this. And yeah, I mean, Nord Stream too will be, um, it's going to be fascinating to see how this is, how this is actually eventually uh, resolved. Um, I think it was Lauren who said this, but I think, I suspect uh, she was right that ultimately, I think Washington will probably have to sort of swallow its, uh, its uh, reservations on this one, um, just to, uh, because ultimately, you know, keeping the Germans on board is going to be absolutely critical. One other point I would make about Germany, and, and this, <laughs> this is something that um, uh, I heard um, a security expert on a podcast, an American security expert on a podcast, make this point um, of, um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it was in relation to the Trump administration's um, announcement that it was going to start reducing its forces in Germany and transfer some of them, transfer some of them to Poland. Um, and he made the point: well, it's fine to make this sort of declaration, but actually, there's a hell of a lot of infrastructure in Germany. You can't just simply, um, you know, click your fingers and overnight suddenly move three thousand, five thousand, whatever it was, you know, um, troops eastwards. You know, Germany is an absolutely sort of critical hub for the US military, not just for, not just in terms of European security, but also, you know, the wider, um, the wider European neighborhood, if you like, so North Africa, uh, you know, further, you know, into, probably into Southern Asia as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, Germany, I think Germany will be critical. I mean, where I take the point that maybe Merkel's reaction was sort of underwhelmed when uh, when uh, um, Biden announced that uh, that there was going to be a freeze on all of this. But but fundamentally, yeah, I mean, I think I think Germany is going to be critical uh, from, from from the American perspective to to continue to work uh, work with Germany. Um, yeah, I mean, sure, Poland does have this sort of regional aspiration um, to be. Uh, uh, or potentially could have this aspiration to be um, um, Washington's sort of chief partner, let's say, in Eastern Europe. But but aside from the values, again, as I say, it, it is going to, you know, it is going to take some time um, um, to put in the necessary infrastructure. I mean, I know President Duda was talking about Fort Trump and all the rest of it, uh, which uh, which was uh, um, <laughs> a sort of an acknowledgement of. Uh, uh, of the former president's uh, um, concern with marketing. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, these things just aren't gonna happen overnight. And uh, so as I say, yeah, I, I suspect. On the Russia thing, very quickly. So um, um, yeah, again, I agree uh, with what was said, um, especially, I mean, I, who knows, but I find it very difficult to conceive of Russia sort of, um, um, uh, um, taking an overt act of aggression against a NATO member, um, but I might be wrong on that, obviously. Um, but I think Wojtek's point of that you're much more likely to see a sort of hybrid um, sort of warfare, um, you know, a grey area uh, where you know, Russian aggression would be much more ambiguous. And, and you know, were that scenario to unfold, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's far from clear exactly what sort of NATO's response would be in in, in that in in that situation, which does which does raise some troubling questions. One final point, and then I'll move on to um, um, the uh, the other question that uh, Wukesh asked. Um, um, is um, yeah, I mean, just in terms of you know, does Russia constitute? Well, obviously it does constitute a security, but what sort of security threat does Russia sort of constitute? Yes, of course, it's a nuclear power. But I, I mean, my own personal opinion is that, um, you know, the Russian strategy in recent years of focusing on cyber warfare and disinformation and things like that. I mean, that's almost, I would say, a sort of indi reflection of Russian weakness. The fact that, you know, they don't have um, vast amounts of sort of conventional forces to fall on. And what they do have, I think, is, is, is probably of fairly poor quality. So I almost, my own sense, and I, again, I'm not, I, I wouldn't profess to be an expert on this, and I'm sure maybe... Maybe, maybe others would disagree, but my own sense is that it's almost a sort of strategy born out of relative Russian weakness. Okay, the other 
Uh, we've only got five minutes, unfortunately. Okay. Right, okay, sorry. Do, do you want me to finish there, then? I'll let the others respond. Okay, that, thanks, yeah. thanks very okay. much. Let's let's do that, um, because we have to keep within our time. Yeah, sure. Limits. What, what check? Two and a half right. minutes, please. Yeah, sure. So <laughs> just a quick uh, take on the gap between kind of political elites and then the public opinion, the, the, their views of, in international affairs. I would argue uh, I don't have data with me. So it's just, you know, uneducated guess that, uh, that the gap is kind of uh, growing, depending, of course, where you, where you ask, uh, because the, the public opinion is much more concerning only on the kind of domestic issues. Uh, and uh, we in the, mostly in democratic states have patience to, to pay attention to one international event at the same time. If it's more, we usually lose, lose interest. Um, it's, of course, in the longer run, quite a dangerous trend because, like I said, the, the, if the public loses interest in international affairs, uh, we basically don't know what's going on around. You know, the, I would just uh, uh, refer to, to, to the latest uh, NATO 2020 report and, you know, how different NATO member states view membership in NATO. And, but we don't have time to go into it. So I will stop here and leave floor to Lauren. Thank you. Thank you. Laura. Thank you. I'll, I'll be very brief. I, I agree 100%. There's a gulf between public opinion and politicians. And I think in the US context in particular, it's very clear. And the country is split. There's 70 million people that, that voted based on this feeling that they were left behind, that they were not served by their government, um, and that we needed to put America first. And, and that was very evident in, in the elections. I think Biden is trying to play to that with this idea of foreign policy for the middle class. I think it's not exactly clear what that means or what that will look like yet. I will say from my own personal experience, trying to, to explain in our public diplomacy work, you know, the importance of the NATO alliance to your average American citizen. It's a tough, lofty argument to make when you have to rely on these things like shared values and way of life. And, you know, there are some concrete arguments, of course, for for the close relationship between the two countries and, and economic relations and trade relations and, and the peace and security that that brings. Um, but it is a, a tough argument to sell, I think, in this environment. And, and it's also, we don't always have concrete examples um, of how our forays abroad have served American interests. And, and we haven't always gotten it right as the United States. And so I think we have some serious introspection and lessons to learn from, from our own um, actions. And, and I think the American people are going to continue to hold leaders accountable that way. But I think the, the growing divided electorate, the information space, this increasingly hyper-polarized, hyper-political um, space for debate that we're having now really limits our ability to do that. So um, I think that's going to be a real defining challenge for, for the United States in the coming years. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. The encouraging thing, I think, by the way, on public opinion in the United States is it's still pretty firm on NATO. I think there is a majority uh, in favour Around about 60%, I believe, uh, perhaps even slightly higher. And that, that's held throughout the Trump years uh, and seems to be uh, holding today. But unfortunately, our time is up. I, I would like to thank, uh, firstly, our three uh, panelists very much for finding the time to come here today uh, and, uh, and, and expressing their views so, so cogently. I'd like to thank the participants for staying the course, as we always say. I know that you have a busy social schedule ahead of you in these pandemic uh, days and the weekend is going to be packed with outside activities. But thanks for anyway, not going on your uh, trips uh, into the countryside now, but, uh, but uh, beaming in here. And uh, thank you to, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Megan Palmer, my colleague at LSE Ideas and the Ratsu Forum for putting together this uh, panel. And hopefully we will be meeting again soon. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Bye.